welcome to introduction to MP Lab. Um, in this video, what we're going to do is just kind of show you where you can get MP Lab, what is MP Lab, and uh, how you install it, how do you write a program, how do you debug it, and all of that various aspects of uh, this development environment. So MP Lab is a in, in a, uh, is an IDE developed for writing C, assembler, and other languages for all of microchips, uh, controllers, and, uh, and uh, computers, microprocessors. So um, uh, when, you, when you install it, the screen you're gonna get is the screen we are looking at right now. But before we go into um, how we use MPLab, if you don't have MPLab on your computer, all you need to do is simply go to uh, microchip.com. I mean, microchip is the developer for this uh, software, it's free. And then you go to development tools. I like to go to the archives one, archive side, because in the archive side, what they do is they provide you with any patches, of course, that are new, as well as uh, they'll give you choice of which operating system you're working on and they got a pretty good coverage because they got the windows they got the mac and they got linux all covered uh, with their tools now um i like to use one version of it as you can see there's lots of different versions and it's changing on an ongoing basis so we kind of settle on using 5.1 and they archive it, so at any time you want, you can get it. If you want to go to a newer version, you can go to a newer version, but some features may be removed or added and moved around. Once you get used to one version, you can pick up on the second version easier. So if this is the first time you're using it and you're using this video as a learning tool, you may really start, start with MPLAB 5.1. And then once you get comfortable, comfortable, if you want to get more stuff, more different stuff or different views, you can go to the later versions. Okay. So so let so all you do is find which operates if your window, you click on this one and that and follow the instruction and install it. And I think for the starting place, just use the default setting when you install it. That's probably the best thing to do. So once you have installed it and you run it, what you're gonna get is this screen. So now the question is, what do I do with this? So in all of these ID, there's a concept of project and project is where we put a lot of files in there and those files are built together to create the output we need, which is gonna be executed on the processors. So the first thing we have to do in this process is create a project. And that's relatively simple, much like all the other windowing systems. You just go under file, you say, I want to create a new project so you click on new project as you can see you get a you get a new screen that comes up for our cases since we don't have an embedded operating system or anything that we're going to run this on on the microprocessor we're going to say we're going to build an embedded system so you under the categories you're going to click microchip embedded under the project you say standalone because you're not going to integrate this with another project that you are working on Okay, if you later on, as you get more sophisticated, you want to do those things, those features are available. Then you say next on this one, brings up here. So for, for this exercise, I'm, we are using um, a one of their um, advanced 8-bit processor, one of the smaller devices they have. But later on, as you need more memory, you need more capability, you can go to the more advanced ones if you want. Um, but for now, what we are using, we are going to be, going to be using the advanced 8-bit or PIC-18 uh, in their designation. And then once you've done that, you have to go find a specific device in this. And we are using literally the smallest one they have, which is PIC-18F1220. And then you said, now that you've selected the process, we go set next. And, and there are lots of hardware tools that you can hook, to, hook into. Uh, so you, if you have a physical board that you wanted to emulate or simulate your uh, code in, you can use those devices. But in our case, we are using a simulator, which comes with this IDE. So we're going to go ahead and mark that and move forward. Okay. So so now now we are uh, we are moving along, 
And so we've got the simulator selected. The next idea is that we're gonna go ahead and click next, and that takes us to the next case. As you can see, you can do a compiling, but for this particular exercise, we're gonna do the assembly. So you, the, the compiler tool chain you're gonna select is the uh, MP lab assembly tool set, which is right here. So you're gonna say next, and then now you gotta pick a project. In my case, I'm just gonna say test just to, so as you, and you can notice, as I say test, it also cre it creates a, creates a um, file name according to that and put the .x, that's kind of where we put, that's where the project is stored, project information, like which processor it is, things like that. I always like to create a directory Right, so so I know this project, all its code is in this one, and if I create another project, I'm going to create a directory test two, test three. So each time I'm working on a project, there's no confusion of which these things belongs to which project. I would highly recommend that you create a separate project directory for every one of your project, just simply because it makes your life easier later on. If you create multiple projects in the same directory, there is a possibility of overwriting because you named the file save the same. A lot of time we like to start with our main code called main. And so, so it's, it's a good idea to create different directories so you do not override it. And then finish. And once you say finish, you can kind of notice what happens. Uh, it creates a whole bunch of uh, directories here where you can put assets where the files that you, you would use if you ever if you ever add more header files you put it in the header files important file i'm not sure whatever important file you have to put it in there and then linker files you put it in here source file so with the code we write write most of the time we'll go in the source file here or if you have libraries and loadables you can bring in and put them in here in our case and in this exercise we're just gonna do the source file. So all you need to do, create a source file, you will right click on this thing and you say new. And by the way, assembly file is just a, so, so the only difference between these are, assembly file is just a blank blank file that you have to write everything in. This one, they add some odds and ends in the beginning what they think you normally need for a program. This, uh, and then this is a little simpler version of this odds and ends they do. If you don't see the basic assembly, just click on others, and that will basically take you another place. And from here, you can go assembly and select it. Sometimes it doesn't show up on the first thing, so that's fine. So you click on this one, say that's the file I need. I want just the basic assembly file one, and then say what you want to call it. You can call it new assembly template, or just kind of because we are C train, you can call it main if you like or whatever, really, it doesn't matter what you call it. And then just all you're getting is a blank file. Maybe you have a code someplace else, you can bring it in and use it. I just happened to have some code um, that uh, was part of a lab we were working on as an introduction lab that you're gonna be playing with, you think you're welcome to use it. Um, all it is is a simple counter, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna highlight this whole thing. If I can get it on a page, we'll highlight the whole code and copy and paste it in here, okay? So we'll go back to the MP lab and just paste it in here, okay? And notice what happens. These semicolons are the start of the comments. They're all green and nice. This autumn, I'm telling the processor that I'm using 18F1220. Um, the, uh, the base, the radix or the base for all the numbers I put in, unless I specify it specifically what I'm looking for is always gonna be hex. This stuff is some simple stuff which basically says, hey, um, don't watch dog timers and oscillators and all of those are configured. It's beyond the scope of this to go through too much detail of that. This is much like if you're familiar with C, this is basically defining a bunch of constants so I don't have to say the numbers when I go through the code. Later on in future videos or future work we're gonna do, we're not gonna have to define all these variables. There's an include file we can include that has all the processor special function registers and all the values defined. In here, we actually have two groups, as you can see, we have these things that are special, these are built-in 
registers that have special meaning to the processor, and these are just locations in memory we are naming. And then uh, the, uh, mo almost all your programs will have something like origin zero, org zero, which basically says my code, what my code is that I gave you should start at location zero. Zero is kind of a special location because that's where, we, if you reset the processor, that's the where you go to find the first instruction application zero in memory. And the rest of this is code, and we are to the end of it. And always, always at the end of this program, you have to put a word and to move so the code assemblers or the builder knows where the end of your code is. So that pretty much gets us to how, and I can type whatever code I want or whatever in here. Now, since I copied this, a lot of tabs and all that stuff is gone. It's always a good idea to tab these out so they look kind of nice. I'm not gonna take the time to go through and do this. But typically, it's a good idea to have at least one tab in the beginning, maybe a tab separating this and a tab separating this. And then the code looks, it's a little easier to read if you do this to it, OK? Like that. Now, remember that these, these like, for example, oh, by the way, blank lines are fine. You can put as many blank lines as you want. And when you get to the loops, this this is called a label. When you label is when when I want to jump someplace or I want to branch someplace, instead of you no know, saying specifically where I'm going to, I could put a label, and then when I want to jump to it, I just jump to the label. Those labels, such as include or loop or whatever other labels you have, has to start in column one. Otherwise, you get an error. Everything else cannot start at column one. All the instruction must be in column two or later. Uh, in the line, okay? So so this code should work, and so what's now that I've entered my code and hopefully it's working and it's the right things, so what do I do next? So the next thing I need to do is I need to um, assemble the project, assemble my code, and there are multiple ways. You can, <clears throat> you can go to these, um, there are menus up here to do the various things you need to do. <clears throat> there's the debug menu, there's a production menu, so you can build, clean build, or you can just simply do the little thing with a broom and a hammer, which is clean up and build. I kind of like to do a clean up and build because it clears all the pre-existing things that are going on and builds the whole thing for me. So if I click on this one, as you can see now down here, this is the council window. And if you see, it goes through and basically says, okay, I was successfully did the cleanup. And then, and then later on, it tells me, yep, I got everything done. Okay, it's really important for you to look through all the feedback and make sure there's no green or and there's no um, blue or red stuff down here. You know, up here, it sees color coordinated, all the commands, the, the understand, assembly codes that I understand are in blue. All the comments are in green, and red is just variables. But let me go ahead and introduce an error in here, so just we can kind of see how how it all plays out. Okay, so let's see what would be a good. Uh, so so I can change this. The, there's no command. EC the clear left. It's not a command. So if I if I um, go ahead and try to build or compile this thing. You notice I get some blue lines. You need to pay, even though blue is a warning, you really need to pay attention to it and uh, make sure that you're dealing with it. Now, in my, and then errors are clear, errors are in red, although some of these say error, but they come out in blue. Anyway, make sure blues and reds, anything blue and red in your council, the, the output is the output window is taken care of. Otherwise, you could have a bit of a problem. Okay, not a bit of a problem. Your your code has not compiled. Okay, so when you go and if you don't know where the error is, it tells you exactly where the error is. So you can either click here or go to line twenty seven. It's up to you. So you go it takes you up here. I'm gonna correct this thing. Life is good. Then I have to clean and compile, and there I, everything comes back normal. Okay, so so that's all you have to do to assemble your code and be ready to roll. Now, 
if you're if you ever wanted to do this, um, that is um, when you do writing a report or doing something else, it's really nice not only to include your assembly code, but also include the machine codes that generated from the assembly. And in order to do that, you just simply go to Windows, and there should be a debugging somewhere in here. Debugging, under debugging, you should have uh, this assembly listings that should uh, uh, should, should show, uh, oh, so should be an output here somewhere. Output, sorry, output, uh, oops, debugging output, this, um, this assembly file, and you click on this one. Now, for the first time you use this device, you may get this message, which basically says, hey, you told me not to generate any symbols for you, so I didn't do it. I can go back and show you what the assembly code looks like. In order to fix this, and this is a good thing for you to know, this bold name of your project will be in bold. So all you need to do is a right click on it, go to the property sections of this, and that would allow you to kind of, kind of um, uh, uh, correct, correct the problem that you were encountering when you did the listing. So you go unloading, and all you need to do when you're here check load symbols okay and um and then say apply say okay now when you get back here you notice that this thing still doesn't have an assembly code even you did the work then you go back to your code domain.c you have to reassemble it with the labels enabled and hopefully if that happens when you go back here we got all this this assembly code this assembly code is really important, and if you have the disassembly code, you don't need to include your assembly code because if you notice, on the right-hand side, you got the assembly code. On the left-hand side, or yeah, with the comments and everything, then you got the assembly code without the comment, and then these are the machine code. That's what the computer sees when you say clear F port A access. Then the computer sees six, 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 this 16-bit value. This is in hex in location zero because you said the origin was zero. So the first uh, instruction will be located in location zero and then the, they would put the next instruction location two and on and on. Okay, so that's pretty much how you compile it. Now you wanna find out did this thing work or did it didn't work, okay? So in that case, then, then what becomes really helpful is the, um, is the, um, simulator and the debugger, how do you initialize it and things like that. So, so what we could do is go to the debug, debugger, and we can set up a new watch. Um, this is where we, if we wanted to watch stuff, we can both watch memory location and other things. For example, port A and port B were pretty useful to us. So if we wanted to look at port B, I can click on this, say P, that's a quick way to jump to the bottom of it instead. You can scroll through the whole thing, but this is a little faster. So you go to port A and it's okay, I want port A, so it gets added here. I want another uh, thing and I want port, oops. Let me go ahead and add another, click on the add, and I want port B, so I'll just change that to port B. Of course, you can put whatever whatever you want. And notice these are special function registers. If you recall, the special function registers are the registers that are have been defined as part of the processor. They have a meaning when you put stuff in there, things happen in the processor. And then there's a whole other set, which we call the general purpose registers. And in those cases, it's just locations in memory that you can store data. For example, in here we have count and location. So, so uh, let's go ahead and add port B. One other thing that I, the W register, as you know, it's a critical register. That's where everything goes through W register. And uh, that's kind of a working register. And you really should include that pretty much anytime you look at things, okay? So that's basically tells me how those values are being changed and things are happening uh, there, okay? And then, um, uh, the what else do we need and then and then if you have inputs that we are expecting into our system 
then we have to go ahead and um, and create a stimulus to stimulate the um, uh, the thing. In this program, it counts whatever changes are happening on bit zero or port A or RA zero is another name for it. So I really would like to create a um, input or a stimuli to see how if my code um, is counting correctly or not. So the, in order to do that, you just simply go to debug, I'm sorry, I go to Windows again. And you say in window, I want to do the sim, look at the simulator and in simulator, I want to create a stimuli. Okay. So when you do that, then you just basically say, okay, which pin do you want to worry? You look at the name of the pin and which one you want. In our case, we want RA0. Okay. Once you say RA0 and then say, what do you want to do with RA0? We can do, you can set it to a specific voltage. You can pulse, pulse high once, pulse low high. I kind of like to do a toggle because every time, later on, every time I click on the fire, it's just going to send one pulse. Let's go, oh, change from zero to one. Toggle means change from zero to one. If it's a one, go to zero. So back and forth. Every time you hit a toggle, it goes changes from zero to one or one to zero. Whatever it is, it's going to invert it. So that's what's called a toggle. I kind of like toggle. You can you can use anything you want, or you can if if you're doing testing on something that needs an analog input, you simply set whatever voltage you want. But just remember the uh, that's fine. So we'll set it to toggle, and that's it. So now this this program supposedly is a program where it accepts the inputs on pin zero of port A, and I believe it puts the outputs on. Uh, uh, port B. Let's see. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we've got this figured out. So now that I have set up the variables I want to look at with the watch, I've set up my stimuli, what the input is. And by the way, when they say output, that's not output. This is output of the IDE, not your output. So, so that's, um, that's pretty much where we are with this whole thing. And um, the next thing we're gonna do is try to debug these things. So and in order to debug these things, we're just gonna go to the debug and say debug projects and it launches a project, okay? Now, now the cool thing about this is that, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna close the listing so it doesn't jump in that I wanna look at it through here, okay? And then, um, so uh, the program is there, it's running. You can kind of see the thing is running down here. It's indicating the code is running through here. And um, I, it doesn't, so, so there are kind of nice, there are a number of features under the debug. By the way, the soft keys are kind of useful. Um, uh, so let me go ahead and pause. I'm gonna pause the debugger so the code is paused. And this highlight, see this arrow with the green? It's highlighting where I stopped it, okay? Now, I can go under debug, and there is like, I can, there is some useful one is F5. If I, would, if I just wanted to continue on, I'll just say F5. Hit F5 or just say continue, and this thing starts back up. You see that? So let's go back here, pause it again. Or if I don't want it to constantly run, the other option is to say um, step into F7. So if I say step into, I'm gonna do F7 instead of going to the menu, it's a little easier. So if I say F7, it's just gonna walk one step at a time. Why is that useful? Because I'm as I'm running through, I can put it in here and I can say F7. And as this is operating, anything that any of these ports I'm looking at as they change, you're gonna see the value change here so I can take a look at it. So. Since I haven't given it any input, nothing is changing. So if I go over here and toggle this one, fire, and then go back and look at the variable, and I'm gonna say F7 now. Notice when I fired it, remember it was uh, toggled, toggled the variable on a uh, bit zero of uh, port A, so I got a one in here. So it's hopefully it's gonna start counting. You might have to go back to zero to count, but let's see what happens. So if I go F7, oh, notice W register went to one. That's exactly what was supposed to happen here. If you follow the instructions here, 
and then if you continue and continue on and then since we had an input it says call the increment so now it's going to hopefully increment port port b and there it is and you notice how it changes so this is called simulation because you can watch you can change the input to the stimuli and then watch what's happening here and there is there is a i don't want to mess up my screen but there's a way if you want to grab one of these and move it up you could do that so you can be looking at the stimuli and the variable so typically when you want to prove and you prove the testing of your code is working what you need to do is kind of have a image of both of these codes showing where the instruction is and what was it that you were seeing you know, in the input and output on these variables. One other thing I should do so you can kind of have seen it, if you wanted, for example, to along here, in, in addition to watching for this, maybe watch for location 80 as well, you could do that, but you have to come here and say zero, global, global sub zero x 80, okay? And then it kind of puts it down here is one by the location 80 and it's right now it's value is one. So that's pretty much what you need to do to write a code and simulate it through this. One other thing I wanted to kind of throw in here so you know it. So let's say, let's say you just, you're not interested in sitting there and hitting F1, F1 in here, especially if you got some loops that are going through and counting a lot, but you really want to, you want to run it until it hits this instruction. So all you have to do, you've got to move your cursor here, click on it, and you see that red button that gets speared? That's called the breakpoints. So you created a breakpoint. You can have many, many breakpoints, as many as you want. So when you go back to debug and you say continue, or if you remember F5, after a while, it's kind of get burned into your brain. You say F5, what is going to happen to this code is that if I say F5 will continue, it's going to run out. See, notice what happens and down there. If I press F5 again, it basically runs through the rest, rest of the code and come here. If I had another breakpoint, let's say I had a breakpoint here. Now when I say continue, oh, it never got here. Let's notice because I didn't change the input, it never gets in here. But let's go here and I toggle the input and then I say F5 again, okay? And so, so that's kind of how you can have many, many, um, um, see every time I say continue, it just runs to the next point. That's a way to speed up your step, being instead of stepping through. But the first time you write the code, especially if this is the first time you're writing this, it's really, really important to single step through your code look at all the things you're changing and make sure they are changing the way you think they're supposed to change. Because um, it's possible that you have an image of how things are supposed to work and how they really work or not the same. That brings us to the end of this process. So we talked about how do you, where do you find the MP Lab 5.1 or whatever version you want, in this case 5.1. How do you create a project? How do you add your code to it? how you assemble it, and how do you make sure that your code is doing what you need to do through the debug and the simulation. Hope that's been helpful and see you in the future videos.